looking intently at an ear, that weird appendage, what is an eye or a pair of lips or an ear? Suddenly, you see, and it's not an eye or an ear, but a little universe composed of the most extraordinary elements. One is astounded by the metamorphoses a human countenance undergoes. Rabelais, for all your ills, I give you laughter. is the most important thing, not at others, but at yourself, huh? That's the great thing. The day when I graduated from high school and we were all asked, what would we like to be? I had no idea what I wanted to be, so I said, I think I'm going to be a clown, the symbol of man's uh, suffering on earth, you might say, and his uh, uh, conquest over it, too, you know. But. I was saying a great truth because at bottom I think there is a great deal of the clown in me. I'm a sort of a schizoid type who laughs and cries at the same time. <laughs> My book is the man that I am. The confused man, the negligent man, the lusty, obscene, boisterous, thoughtful, scrupulous, lying, diabolically truthful man that I am. Jakob Gimple, world-renowned pianist and dear friend. Philosophically, in a Zen thing, like Zen, the idea is, you know, you live from moment to moment. So in doing that, the, this moment decides the next step. You shouldn't be five steps ahead, only the very next one. And if you can keep to that, you're always all right. See, but people are thinking too far ahead and sidelines and all that. Do you know what I mean? Think only what's right there. Do only what's right under your nose to do, right? You know? It's such a simple thing that people can't do it, you know? Buford Delaney, the amazing and invariable Buford Delaney, the nearest to a saint that any artist can be. Anna Eastnin, author of the now famous diary, an inspiration to and a protectress of so many striving artists, including yours truly, Henry Miller. I just finished this book about writing and the writers, and I said that if they would trust, that people could do this if they trusted the artist to do the dreaming, you see, and then instead of taking drugs, say, they yeah. watch a painting for a long time or watch a mobile for a long time or trusted the artist or looked yeah. at a you know, painting very deeply, that they would be set off on their own, um, their own dreaming. Uh, Lawrence Clark Powell, librarian and writer, whom I first met in Dijon when I was an instructor in the Lycée Carnot, a very dear friend. 
and a very uh, understanding critic of my work. Oh, God. It's a sheet of wallpaper. Where did you buy these papers, Henry? Where did you get these papers? Oh, this must be the cast of characters for what days? Days. Capricorn. Capricorn oh, plan. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a plan for the Ville de Capricorn. Ideas. Obsession. Dials. Dial. Let's see. Now Dostoevsky for Xerxes Society. See, you get me? You see? What a cunning bastard, huh? And, uh, what shall I say? A cheat and one. Still, I'm thinking what style I can use. Not my own. Do you understand? Not me. Right. Hansen. Holy. Harris. God. Tagore. Spengler. Anatole Franz. Somerset Maugham. Dos Passos. Ingersoll and Tolstoy. Romain Roland. Kropotkin. Sinclair Lewis for rantings. For rantings? Yeah. Ranting, you know? Dreiser for desertion theme. Sherwood Anderson for yearnings and introspection. How do you like that? That that hits me. I don't remember all this. Anymore. Henry Miller. Yeah. What? For for what? What was left? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do I call? Yeah. I write the, co the coda. Yeah, the coda. The index. <laughs> So I said, I'm going to give you the original picture, which is two meters by, by a meter fifty. He says, where will that Gregory Michons, one of the first painters I met in Paris, a man thoroughly dedicated to his work. Yes, Of course, listen, in writing, I think that one writes to discover himself. In this thing, I'm just plain, that's all, don't you know? To me, I attach no importance to what I do in painting, none at all. I'm just having a good time. And, and I think this is a very important thing in life, that people learn how to play, and that they make life a game rather than a struggle, uh, you know, to, uh, for goals. And, but the playing is so much more important. Lawrence Darrow author of the Alexandria Quartet and other well-known books, came to see me in Paris at about the age of 23 or 4 as a young writer and who has remained an everlasting friend. Sidney Omar, a friend of some years standing now, quite famous as a, an astrologer. Take a horoscope or take the birth data. I've always been interested in the occult because I have never been able to accept this world. I know that there is another world behind it, which is the real world. The occult embraces many domains, from the gift of prophecy to palmistry, the reading of tarot cards. My palm has been read. It's unusual that the heart and the headlines run together. They shouldn't. They should be separate. They should go off. And my heart and head go together. Now, uh, what does it mean? I don't know. Um, my interest is not so much in the knowable as in the unknowable, which is infinite. Alfred Perlez, whom I often refer to as Joey, my boon companion throughout the 10 years stay in Paris, author of a number of books in French, German, and English, and who saved my life when I was at the point of returning to America or committing suicide. Did you ever think about me as a kind of a split personality? It's a feeling of being split. I can... Um, see uh, two ways, or many ways often, don't you know? If I have to think about something, and a problem or something, um, I, I am not a logical thinker, um, and my feelings dictate my thinking a great deal, don't you know? Brassai, world-famous photographer, for me, the eye of Paris, also writes, paints and sculpts. Joe Gray. Joe, uh, this is our third session in right. this historic film. Um, it better be good. It's <laughs> better. Uh, the first one was at your pad, you remember? Right. And uh, I posed you as the veteran of the screen, do you remember? But you had a couple of broads there, and I think they got drunk and ruined it. Yeah, where they shoot the picture. <laughs> 
Hey, uh, boy, uh, bye-bye, uh, all those out. The second time you were the ex-pug, you remember, with Tommy oh, Palmer, the, right the uh, manager's home. Manager. What names, these names. Yeah, this is another yeah. whole world, you know, huh? The names. I think I've got you now in really your real role in life. Uh, now, I always told you that if you hadn't been a, an actor or a fighter, prize fighter, you could have been a great teacher. Uh, you come like out of a rabbinical tradition, um, and you're a bit of a psychoanalyst or a psychiatrist, you're a healer, you like that. Uh, Dr. Gray, I called you in today because I have a strange case. Uh, he's got strange symptoms. For example, he's uh, complaining about arthritis. Well, to begin with, he's only 20 or 21, a little young to have arthritis all through his body. Uh, in another six months at this rate, he would only be able to crawl on the floor, do you see? I just can't envisage such a situation. I could heal arthritis or earaches or something like that, <laughs> or stuttering. Mm. But if a man is lovesick, I don't get very far with him, generally speaking, because uh, I don't like to go back to the womb and all that business, you know? I like to uh, keep it within the realm of, um, what, immediate circumstances. What, what is the name again? What is it? Was it Tom or Tom? Uh, Tom. Tom, was it? Tom Schiller. Tom, Tom well, Schiller. Wait, Tom Schiller? Uh, is that yeah. your pseudonym or is that your real name? This, this is my real name. That's your name. real name. You were born that way? Yes. You weren't baptized? No. No. All right. That already tells us something. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you circumcised. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Tom. Don't you think that this is a very common thing with uh, young people, this unrequited love on the part of the parents? Yo, uh, sure. Lack of affection. Everybody. It's almost uh, every case today, isn't it? Yes. Huh? And don't you find, Tom, often that um, the children who think that way are really mistaken about their parents, that their parents do love them, yeah, but perhaps don't show it in the way that the child expects. Was there any other children in the family? Yeah, I have a brother, younger brother. Uh, does he get more favor with your parents? Uh, no. Now, I don't think that's the, that's the thing. I mean, uh, listen, uh, young man, I must tell you, first of all, it's not your place to say what <laughs> you all, think. We don't, you know, like we don't want to know me. what you Next think. You know we are the one. On <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, that's, we're working on you. Uh, right. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, the He's moment that he realizes that everything is in his hands mm. and he doesn't blame his parents or the world or right. society, he's a long way already toward the goal, see? Uh, the main thing now is for him to assume this uh, responsibility completely, don't you know? I think that he so. can say confidently to himself, he doesn't need anybody I alone can do it. I alone am responsible for everything that happens to me. What is your thought on that? In other words, he has to accept his yes. situation. Right. Don't you think we have to uh, consider that point when we ask him to love without being loved? This is a most difficult thing. In fact, I, doctor, with all my wisdom it. and experience, I can't do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you go about the world, when you find a man who has no problems, come to me and give me his name and address. I would like to meet him. But, you know? uh, but why don't you get down here? All right, I will. You want to uh, give me a little... Well, there's a yeah. switch oh, I ever saw. Yeah, yeah, yes. There's uh, a switch. Doctor, the patient can't cure becomes himself. a doctor. Uh, all right. The master becomes uh, a patient. Right. Well, can I get up there? Okay. What size shoe? What size shoe? Oh, that's... Oh, that's, that's, oh, that's oh, I've got uh, the real art. Yeah, right. okay. Uh, i got real art. Right. You do? Uh, you, are you sure it's real? Yes, this I'm quite convinced of, but mine comes about um, because of age, I think, you well, know? Are you certain? Age and abuse of the bodily functions, you know? My stomach is and gets cramped and oh, my toes curl up and I can't straighten them out. <laughs> is that right? I get insomnia very frequently. Yeah, but yeah. well, tell me, for someone who strikes me as found, as uh, finding the you know the uh, answers the answers of life to giving into life, flowing yeah. with life, whatever. Yeah. 
Why would you have insomnia? That they can't go all one way. I was in love with a girl, Japanese girl. Uh huh. Now, and this, <clears throat> this is if I step on your foot and I say, you know, forgive me. Sue me, my son. You should just run, go in the side. I know that one, I'm sorry. And then I had difficulty going to sleep. So then I began doing these things, you know, with her in mind. Uh, I do something. You see a lot of writing on them. Rather crazy things. Words popped into my head. Japanese nightmare. Style Scorpio. Scorpio was her sign. My first big memory. My mother did the first terrible thing for which I never forgave her. My mother had a wart. And she said to me, Henry, I'm only four years old. I'm sitting in this little chair. What should I do? I says, cut it off with scissors. Two days after that, she got blood poison. And she said, and you told me to cut it off. And bang, bang, she slaps me. Slaps me for the punishment, for telling her to do this. How do you like a mother who did that? I lived, you see, in Brooklyn. This is now 85th Street, Yorkville section. I'm say eight to 12 years old at period. When I come there to visit my cousin, he says to his friends one by one, this is Henry, Henry Miller from Brooklyn. And uh, they almost bow to me, the boy. I'm made already the leader of the gang because I'm from another neighborhood. They bring me things that they steal. I fight with them in rock fights. We have fights in the uh, lots, the open, with rocks. And I tell a story there how I believe I killed one boy, do you know? I never went to the police, naturally. And I came home, remember, and got the rye bread from his mother and all that. It was a wonderful, tender neighborhood, tender with violence, again American. You know, such warmth and then this ferocity for no reason. I can't understand. Yeah. Oh, my mother. She was a peculiar woman, you know. The neighbors said she loved me. They said that she was really greatly fond of me and all that. I never felt any warmth from her. She never kissed me, never hugged me. I don't ever remember going down and putting my arms around her. You know? That was a big loss. I didn't know that mothers did that till one day I visit a friend of mine, his house. We're 12 years old. And I go home with him and his mother, they were English. And um, I hear the mother's voice. Jackie, oh, Jackie, she says, darling, how are you? How have you been? Put your arms around him, you know, and kiss him. She says, I never heard that kind of language, do you see? That even that tone of voice, new to me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because in that stupid German neighborhood, they were great disciplinarians. They were brutal people. All my boyfriends, when I go home with them, they would say, defend me, help me. If my father starts to hit me, grab something and let's run, do you know? I, yeah, it was all brutality and discipline, you see. Crazy. It's the street of early sorrows. Before that, was the good time of my life, up to nine years of age, in the worst neighborhood of all, in the worst possible neighborhood. That was my golden period, on the streets. Boys who later went to the penitentiary and, you know, committed all kinds of crimes. They were my great friends and my heroes, and to this day, I admire them, you know? Yeah. Well, my sister was a moron, and it was born a uh, half-witted. You see, um, she has the intelligence of a child of about eight or ten. And uh, she was a great 
burden in my life because uh, I had to defend her when the kids called Crazy Loretta, Crazy Loretta, you know. Uh, made fun of her, pulled her hair, and oh, terrible. And I'm always chasing these kids and fighting with them, you know. Uh, and there was never any conversation. And, you know, she drove me crazy. She can talk, but she talks a mile a minute about trivia. It makes sense, but it's about little things, a little cut here, pinpoint, you know, leaf on it. Do you see what I mean? Uh, no continuous thing either. After an hour with her, I was nearly nuts, though, body, you know, with, with this conversation. <laughs> and then she had the faculty of crying easily over nothing, maybe out of joy, but silent tears. She didn't cry loudly, you know, silent. Just they just flew down like that, poured down her face, and you never knew why. You'd ask her why. She might say, "I'm happy." <laughs> uh, you know, you know, it was all oh, very emotional. As a little boy, my mother says to me one day, you know, while teaching, the kid couldn't go to school because they she couldn't learn. She, they sent her home, and then my mother starts to teach her. And my mother couldn't teach her. My mother was terrible. She used to crack her, hit her. And uh, she'd say, how much is two times two? And my sister would be frantic. She'd say, five. No, seven. No, three. You know, just wild. Bang. My mother hit her like that. My mother would turn to me and say, why did I have to bear this cross? What did I do to be punished? Ask me, a little boy. Why did God punish me? You know, you can see what kind of a mother this was. Huh? Stupid, huh? With a <laughs> towel, towel. My father. My relations with him, they were rather cool while I uh, worked in the tailor shop because uh, my mother had hoped that I would prevent him from drinking, see, keep uh, tabs on him and all that, but I couldn't. And of course, he uh, bothered me, disturbed me, being drunk every day, coming home drunk, quarrels and all that. Uh, and uh, it was only later, he was always very wonderful. And he always believed in what I was doing, though he never read anything, you know. Huh? said, go to it, go ahead, and all right, hope you make out. <coughs> then, um, of course, he became ill. He gave up drink suddenly, all, like, all of a sudden like that. And that was his downfall. When he did that, he became ill. Up to then, he had been in good health. And he was a man who had great friends. Everyone spoke highly of him. What a wonderful man he was, you know. In the tailor shop, I hated the business. I had no interest in that at all. But, you know, I couldn't see myself becoming a tailor. All that I got out of that two, three, or four years, I don't know how long it was, was a knowledge, a feel of woolens and silks, what they, you know, good material and fancy vest buttons. <laughs> she said, you know, they used to wear vests with fancy buttons in those days. Mm, but I know a good piece of material when I touch it. And I know when a suit fits properly and all that. Well, I had dis I discovered New York. Well, I had lived in it, you know, so much all my life. And um, then my great discovery of New York was when I was with the Western Union. Four and a half years, employment manager. And after I finished my day's work, I would eat dinner with the detective of the company, he'd come at that hour, and we'd go out together to visit the, uh, the uh, telegraph offices, and we'd be looking for crooks and runaway boys and all that. That brought us into every nook and cranny there in New York, every dive, oh, the Bowery, the east side, the upper, the Harlem, everything. I knew it all like a book, you know. And I was getting home then. I was due at work every morning at 8 o'clock. I, I seldom arrived at 8. <laughs> but uh, when I did, there'd be a whole mob waiting for me in the ante room, you know, waiting to be hired. Because we had largely the scum, the riffraff, don't you know? 
And uh, among them, there were great kids. Lots of them were crooks. They, they, I didn't mind it too much. But uh, they're all liars. Nearly all young kids are liars, you know? It's amazing. They, and the best, uh, the model ones who look so beautiful and pious, you know, and good, they were the worst ones always, you know, huh? Mm. See, I visited at night their homes, you know, often to find out if what was what. Kids would come, you know, begging for the job and then saying, um, but we have nothing to eat at home. My father is ill and this and that. I'd go there. Then I'd try to get the um, charitable organizations interested. And that took so long. I was paying out of my money. I'd give them, you know, keep them going, do you see? Then I borrowed from my associates in the office. I was always in debt in that, the whole time at that job. I owed everybody, helping out these kids, yeah. The Xerxes Society, the group of friends, it was a social and an athletic club. We staged running matches, boxing matches, very much interested in a uh, fight game. When sweet caprols were all the vogue, they gave out little picture cards of soubrettes from the burlesque and of fighters. And among them, my heroes, Corbett and John L. Sullivan, Terry McGovern, Jack Johnson. I was um, crazy about the bicycle and crazy enough to pace the six-day riders. This happened from... Uh, Prospect Park on the beautiful gravel path for bicyclists, cyclists. Six miles right down to Coney Island to the water. We set out leisurely and get faster and faster. And since I was a kid and had the heart and I could spare the strength, they used me, do you know? All this time, of course, in the back of my head, I am a writer who's never writing. I had made one attempt to write with a little broken pencil once, can you imagine? Then I, I wrote a page and gave it up. I said I never would be able to write. Well, but nevertheless, it was in there, in me, and stories and novels I'm writing as I walk, dialogues with characters. And I can remember it. I could say I wrote several books in this period that I worked for my father. Because I did the same thing at night. I walked back again down to that station, do you know? This meant I walked through the Bowery, too, part of the way, do you know? And uh, Union Square and all those... Uh, Madison Square Garden, which was a beautiful building then. Do you remember? Huh? Um, and then on that walk also, I stopped at a certain uh, shop, a uh, framing shop, where I saw my where I got interested in painting, because there I saw my first Japanese prints. I used to stand, and I saw reproductions of Chagall, you know, and your trio, and Matisse, and all that. That was my first, really, um, beginnings of interest in painting, do you see? Um, now, um, all this time, you know, I think that, uh, I'll never be a writer, but I was reading all the current writers of the day, don't you know? For instance, I remember that John Dos Passos was quite a name, I think, then already, but he was not much older than me, or maybe same age. And already he had made it. He had been in the war, and he had written the book about the war, do you recall? And I used to read these men. I say to myself, Jesus, I think I could do as well as that, <laughs> you know? But never, never do it. Huh? Uh, and I'm trying to think then, how did I really? Oh, yes, this is a long while then afterwards. Um, let's see. All right, while still working for my father, I married, my first marriage, you remember? Had a child. And uh, then at night I would come home. I had that big desk that you're curious about, this roll-top desk, you know, which was a pigeonhole desk, remember? This was the desk which had been in the old man's tailoring establishment for the last 50 years, which had given birth to many builds and many groans, which had housed strange souvenirs in its compartments, and which finally I had filched from him when he was ill and away from the establishment. 
And now it stood in the middle of the floor in our huge, lugubrious parlor on the third floor of a respectable brownstone house in the dead center of the most respectable neighborhood in Brooklyn. And I put all the extra chairs we had around it in a circle. And then I sat down comfortably, and I put my feet on the desk and dreamed of what I would write if I could write. All the pigeonholes were empty, and all the drawers were empty. There wasn't a thing on the desk or in it except a sheet of white paper on which I found it impossible to put so much as a pothook. I would sit there then and write, at night, you know. It was nothing any good. I don't think I even... I never even tried to sell any of that stuff, you know. But I was, a, I was married a few years, I guess, when finally I ran into this uh, Mona in my books in the dance hall, and um, we were caught in bed one morning when I thought my wife had gone on a vacation. <laughs> she had only done that to trap me, and there she found me in bed, you see, in my own house with witnesses and everything. So I left her immediately, went to live with uh, June, Mona. After this period with my father, somehow or other, I don't know how I got out of it all. Maybe he had to give up business. I forget it exactly now at this minute. Anyhow, then I had a number of jobs in between like I was assistant editor to a mail hoarder house, like the Charles Williams. I was the editor of that big catalog, you know, they put out. And I was fired one day because I was caught typing out from Nietzsche's Antichrist, you know, uh, while working on work time, you know, the big vice president came through and saw me fired. So then when I go to live, June and I live together, uh, she still worked at the dance hall and used to say to me, look, give up that job, start to write, you know. She pushed me into it. And one day I did quit. I quit like that. Just came in the office one morning. There were 40 or 50 applicants for messenger jobs. And I had my assistant. I said, you tell the boss I'm quitting and I don't want my salary. There was two weeks. I don't want anything. I want to get out. And I walked out with a, a little briefcase with my pen. I never forget, I walked up Broadway feeling like the happiest man on earth, that I'm no longer gonna work for anybody. That was my idea. Now I'm gonna write, do you see? But that was a beautiful walk, looking at all these poor bastards who are working, struggling, selling things, and <laughs> buying things, you know? But then began my years, 10 years of misery, you know, trying then to sell my work. Um, but as I say, the, this uh, desire to write must have been strong in me from way back, you know. But I had no confidence in my ability to write. That was the thing. I had absolutely no confidence. Very strange thing. So I began, you know, by writing, um, oh, I thought I would start like exercises. I'd write about... Uh, things I was interested in, people, events. Uh, I'd go to meet people. I would, I visited the editor of Funk and Wagnall's Dictionary, do you see, and wrote an article long, beautiful, about words, which was, I sold to Liberty Magazine, that five cent magazine. They liked me there. They almost gave me a job as assistant editor, but they paid me, and they paid me, oh, that was fabulous. I think I got $300, which was a big sum in those days. But they never printed it. And I would ask every now and then, it's too good, they said. <laughs> too good, how do you like that? <coughs> Finally, I caught on to the idea of, uh, you know, there were like magazines, like Snappy Stories and things. You remember those that were like our Playboy thing in a way today? I wrote one or two, had, had no luck, and I got onto the idea I should send my wife, who was beautiful, send her in with these things. And of course, then they sold. After I sold two or three, I thought, why should I write the new things? I'll go to the back files 10 years, 12 years ago, 
pull out their own story and uh, change the beginning and end and the names of the character, and I'd sell it to them. This is what they love. It was their own stuff. <laughs> Always merry and bright. If it was before the war and the thermometer down to zero or below, if it happened to be Thanksgiving Day or New Year's or a birthday, or just any old excuse to get together, then off we'd trot, the whole family, to join the other freaks who made up the living family tree. It always seemed astounding to me how jolly they were in our family, despite the calamities that were always threatening. Jolly in spite of everything. There was cancer, dropsy, cirrhosis of the liver, insanity, thievery, mendacity, buggery, incest, paralysis, tapeworms, abortions, triplets, idiots, drunkards, ne'er-do-wells, fanatics, sailors, tailors, watchmakers, scarlet fever, whooping cough, meningitis, running ears, chorea, stutterers, jailbirds, dreamers, storytellers, bartenders, and finally, there was Uncle George and Tante Amelia. The morgue and the insane asylum. No one knew that Tante Amelia was com going completely off her nut, that when we reached the corner, she would leap forward like a reindeer and bite a piece out of the moon, and nobody could think quick enough to stop it. Just like that it happened, in the twinkle of a star. And now I'm going to tell you what those bastards said to me. They said, Henry, you take her to the asylum tomorrow, and don't tell them that we can afford to pay for her. Fine. Always merry and bright. The next morning, we boarded the trolley together, and we rode out into the country. If Mealy asked me where we were going, I was to say to visit Aunt Monica. But Mealy didn't ask any questions. She sat quietly beside me and pointed to the cows now and then. She saw blue cows and green ones. She knew their names. She asked what happened to the moon in the daytime. And did I have a piece of liverwurst by any chance? During the journey, I wept. I couldn't help it. When people are too good in this world, they have to be put under lock and key. There's something wrong with people who are too good. It's true Mealy was lazy. She was born lazy. It's true that she was a poor housekeeper. It's true she didn't know how to hold on to her husband when they had found her one. When Paul ran off with the woman from Hamburg, she just sat in a corner and wept. The others wanted her to do something, put a bullet into him, raise a rumpus, sue for alimony. But Mealy sat quiet. She wept. She hung her head. She was like a pair of torn socks that are kicked around here, there, everywhere, always turning up at the wrong moment. And now she's very tranquil, and she calls the cows by their first name. The moon fascinates her. She has no fear because I'm with her, and she always trusted me. I was her favorite. Even though she was a half-wit, she was good to me. The others were more intelligent but their hearts were bad. Sometimes when she was fired from a job, they used to send me to fetch her. Mealy never knew her way home. And I remember how happy she was whenever she saw me coming. She would say innocently that she wanted to stay with us. Why couldn't she stay with us? I used to ask myself that over and over. Why couldn't they make a place for her by the fire? Let her sit there and dream if that's what she wanted to do. Why must everybody work, even the saints and the angels? Why must half-wits set a good example? I'm thinking now that after all, it may be good for Mealy where I'm taking her. No more work. Just the same, I'd rather they had made a corner for her somewhere. Walking down the gravel path toward the big gates, Mealy becomes uneasy. Even a puppy knows when it is being carried to a pond to be drowned. Mealy is trembling now. At the gate, they are waiting for us. The gate yawns. Mealy is on the inside. I am on the outside. 
They are trying to coax her along. They are gentle with her now. They speak to her so gently. But Mealy is terror-stricken. She turns round and runs toward the gate. I'm still standing there. She puts her arms through the bars and clutches my neck. I kiss her tenderly on the forehead. Gently, I unlock her arms. The others are going to take her again. I can't bear seeing that. I must go, I must run. For a full minute, however, I stand and look at her. Her eyes seem to have grown enormous. Two great round eyes, full and black as the night, staring at me uncomprehendingly. No maniac can look that way. No idiot can look that way. Only an angel or a saint. When I ran away from the gate, I stopped beside a high wall and burying my head in my arms, my arms against the wall, I sobbed as I had never sobbed since I was a child. Meanwhile, they were giving Mealy a bath and putting her into regulation dress. They parted her hair in the middle, brushed it down flat, and tied it into a knot at the nape of the neck. Thus, no one looks exceptional. All have the same crazy look, whether they are half crazy or three quarters crazy or just slightly cracked. When you say, may I have pen and ink to write a letter, they say yes, and they hand you a broom to sweep the floor. If you pee on the floor absentmindedly, you have to wipe it up. You can sob all you like, but you mustn't violate the rules of the house. A bug house has to be run in orderly fashion, just as any other house. When Mealy stood at the gate with eyes so bright and round, her mind must have traveled back like an express train. Everything must have leaped to her mind at once. Her eyes were so big and bright, as if they saw more than they could comprehend. Bright with terror, and beneath the terror, a limitless confusion. That's what made them so beautifully bright. You have to be crazy to see things so lucidly, so all at once. If you're great, you can stay that way, and people will believe in you, swear by you, turn the world upside down for you. But if you're only partly great, or just a nobody, then what happens to you is lost. Calling Henry Miller. Calling Henry Miller. Henry, are you there? Are you listening? Can you hear us? You can? Hold on a second and I'll give you Joe. Are you there, Joe? <coughs> Joey, are you there? Uh, here I am, Henry. This is a long distance call from Villa Terrain. Now, before I give you the lowdown in French, here's Larry again with an important message. Oh, Henry, what about a rock for a burl with a glass of Clos Rougeau? And the Cinema du Quartier. And a Calvados. And La Pissotière. And Tino Rossi. Collapsible mouth organ. We want Henry, Henry Miller. Miller. We, we want, want Henry, Henry Miller. Miller. think that when you suffer deeply somewhere and you can't escape, you begin to accept the situation and then you find the marvelous things in it. Don't you know? So in the midst of my uh, poverty and suffering and all that, I really discovered Paris, the true French spirit and everything. and. Um, and got to love it. This was, of course, that's that hard thing to understand, that how can you uh, enjoy being like that right down at the very bottom? And yet I think that is the most important thing that ever happened to me, to be without anything, no crutch of any kind, uh, cut off completely from all help, and then have to find it every day, this help to live from day to day. This is a very good thing, you know. You suffer, sure, you're miserable, but uh, 
it's so interesting, so fascinating. You're so thoroughly alive when you do that. You're living then with your instincts like an animal. And that's a great thing for us uh, over-civilized people to know again how to be a bird of prey or, uh, you know, an animal uh, just wolfing every meal and uh, begging and being humiliated time and again, accepting it, being pushed down and then bouncing back up again. Each day is a miracle that you get through, do you see? Huh? This is a very wonderful thing. Four Avenue Anatole, France, Clichy, April 1932. Dear Amon, no, I don't want to return to America. Nothing but a catastrophe can make me go back. This is my world, and I knew it long, long ago. And I only regret it took so long to make the decision. What a different being I would have been if at 21 I had gone to the Sorbonne or to Alt Heidelberg, or to Sevilla or Madrid, anywhere but City College. However, it hasn't been too late. I will never become a European, but thank God I am no longer an American. I am one of those things you call an expatriate, a voluntary exile. I have no country, no frontiers, no taxes to pay, no army to fight for, and I adore France. It's getting to the point where I will actually have to earn a living. Dear Mr. Miller, it is my painful duty to inform you that your services will no longer be required. I tell you frankly that you haven't grasped the job. Perhaps you are temperamentally unfitted for a job dealing almost entirely in figures. I feel now exactly as all the great vagabond artists must have felt. Absolutely reckless, childish, irresponsible, unscrupulous, and overflowing with carnal vitality, vigor, ginger, etc. Always on the border of insanity, due to worry, hunger, etc. But shoving along day after day. Brassai. The Eye of Paris. And it was in those early days that I used to go with him at night all over Paris, helping him carry his uh, equipment and so on. And I got to see a great many parts of Paris I might never have seen through him. He knew Paris thoroughly. And what I remember then is the thing that everybody knows is his eyes. His eyes are really, they protrude like the lens of a camera. You see, he had only begun to take up photography when I met him. He had been a journalist. He had first been a painter. Then he eked out a living by writing for Hungarian newspapers. And then he took up photography. J'ai mis des Gauloises parce que comme ça quand j'ai besoin de cigarettes, je prie à Saint Sébastien et il me donne. Ah, très joli, très joli. Who is that beautiful Putin? Very much. That's his wife. And I didn't recognize her. This is really Il y a quinze ans peut-être. He's writing a book, you know, like he did for Picasso. He's writing one. Oui. I've never seen any of it. Et je vais, uh, je vais donner après, say, mais uh, oui, je vais après, tout donner. Pas, pas, oui. pas maintenant. Pas, mais... Non, non, mais je, je me demande. Vous écrivez à, à la main, non? Non, oh. euh, aussi à la main. Oh. Henri est en train de prendre son petit bijou. Bijou was this fantastic looking creature, filthy and scaly. Her skin was caked with dirt, her eyes were heavily black. Her fingernails were filthy. Everything about her was filthy, which has these marvelous big eyes, and she read your fortune, and she was a character. <laughs> oh, I may come back home. another day. I I'm hope so. I'm going to be here for a few weeks. Oh, yes. I want you to come back. I'll yes. do a new painting of you. Yes. You know, you did one of me, you remember, in New York. Yes, I did. You have a... Uh, 
call a friend. Well, that's amazing, too, if you open it, that you find room to put your canvas. Uh, what bring was the book, the street boy. again, Buford? Green Street. 181. Oh, yes, that's right. 181? 181. What a memory, huh? Oh, you got plenty of mm. memories. That goes back, what? I have been here now since, uh... Mm. Nice. Oh, by the way, before, before we go further, anything you might see in here that you want, anything at all, mm -hmm. you can have, and I'd like to give it to you. Don't say no to it. Take your time. Show you more things. I, yeah. I have a forest I hang it oh, there. there it is. Symbol to you. There it oh, is. Yes. And that's also in these bright colors. That's that right. Remember? That's right. There's sort of a halo around me almost, I felt. Anybody? That's somebody? right. And another life of misery begins, but on a different level and with a different uh, ambience entirely. Misery compounded with joy. Here I make uh, the best friends in my life. When we were at Minion Montant the other day, taking it. Uh, yeah, we looked down, and there was a church, and he, we were told he was born right near that church there. Yeah. I had two especially good boon companions who were... Um, who are still alive, still writing, and we are still writing one another. That's Lawrence Durrell and Alfred Perlez, whom I call Alf always. Well, you remember the very first evening of the dawn, you were sitting there, there was a pile back high of uh, sources, <laughs> which you couldn't pay for, you remember? I don't know if you had a room or not, but you were in the dump. That's when I invited you to come to my hotel in the, in the Hotel Central. Well, then you uh, proposed that I share your little room up there, that, that uh, hovel of a place. You used to take me well, home. I was in the night shift, you see, you could keep me in, right. in the night. And when I, I came used in. to tread softly, like Smedrikov, <laughs> in your footsteps, so that it would sound like one person. And yeah, when you I would know. say to the night porter, Pelez, mm -hmm. you know, I was marching slowly behind you uh, up the <laughs> stairs, you remember? Yeah, yeah. And then you'd leave money on the mantelpiece for me uh, so that I could at least have uh, my croissant and coffee in the morning. Yeah. Mm. You didn't and leave enough for lunch because you couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> then, well, then began my day, looking for lunch and looking for dinner. I remember with such pleasure my early days in Paris when I walked the streets with empty belly, stopping every few yards to gaze at the paintings, sketches, books, objets d'art displayed in the shop windows. Bread, prime symbol. Americans don't care about good bread. Dying of inanition, go on eating bread without substance, without flavor, without vitamins, without life. The very core of life is contaminated. Think of French bread. So many varieties of bread, all so wonderful. La baguette, la ficelle, le batard, le pain de fantaisie, le pain de campagne, le pain de mie, and not least of all, le croissant. And of course, there was a third person perhaps more important than the two of them in my life, and that was Anais Nin. Anais had a home at Louvaciennes, an old uh, village about an hour distant from Paris by bicycle. Beautiful home on what was formerly the estate of Marie Antoinette. It was a charming place. And you gave me great help, I remember, because you used to go over my early scripts, you remember, mm -hmm. and say, look, don't put all of that. That isn't necessary, <laughs> you know, and you used to have to fight with me about it because I thought it was important. I thought mm -hmm. everything was important. Now, you know, if I could, if I had the power, I would reduce everything. I would write the smallest books if I could, if I had to. I, I appreciate <laughs> them, you know. But uh, you turn out to be right. Because everybody was more worried about what I left out than what I put in. Ah, oh, that's a good point. That's a very, uh, yeah. Clichy was a marvelous working man's quarter with a communist mayor. Here, Perlez and I finally settled in after a hand-to-mouth existence, hotel to hotel, and spent almost two years writing, playing, Passing around.
the day that we landed that place, you remember? The first time we really had a place which mm -hmm. we could call uh, our own, you know. Yeah, uh, we arrived there in the late yeah. afternoon. We came with all, our, with all our luggage, everything ready, ready to move in. And then we, we looked at the wall. You remember the wall? Crawling with bed bugs. Yeah. You remember yeah. that? They yeah. were marching up and down like soldiers, you I... know. <laughs> I lived here two or three years in Clichy. I came here the first time in 1928. I can see this place going on for another hundred years. What's to stop it? Isn't that right? What's to hinder? They make more transformation. They will have some other kind of lighting. Some other kind of uh, demi-mondaine, uh, <laughs> uh, instead of prostitution. And I was sitting over in a corner reading, what am I reading? Uh, Julie Elipour, je crois. A, uh, a break, a baton, a fall, a fading, what do you say? Uh, uh, signal. A signal, we signal. And I thought she said, come over to my table. But she meant, I'll see you outside. Over there, a pray, n'est-ce pas? On se rencontre dehors. Mais moi, je suis allé à sa table, and she was embarrassed, you know. So she didn't want to be thought of as a demi And then she said, uh, vous êtes américain, oui. Qu'est-ce que vous avez? She dit, leave. On say, we, Jamon, the leave, daily war. El regard comes out, el leave, el comes out, huh? Et finalement, el dit, il n'est pas français. Il n'est pas français, celui-là. Oui. Well, don't you remember, too, that night the girls were leaving, uh, they weren't exactly girls, huh? Uh, and um, they wanted money. And neither, none of us had any money. <laughs> and you had a checkbook for an account that didn't exist. And you were writing out a check and handing it to the girl in the bathtub, I remember. And she said, what? That piece of paper? That's no good. What will I do with that? Don't you know? You see, well, pendant que nous vivons, Anatole France, Fred, il avait, how you say, il a trouvé une très jeune fille. Quatorze ans. Quatorze ou quinze? Quatorze. Uh, she was wandering in the street, mm -hmm. compared to you. Mm -hmm. And Allah, he rescued her, brought her home to live with us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, après uh, quelques semaines, on uh, frappe à la porte, hein? <laughs> and voilà, le père et la mère. A très cultivé, très respectable, oui. Um, D'abord, le monsieur dit, c'est très grave, n'est-ce pas? Elle est une mineure, minor. Ça, c'est la prison, gars. Et pendant qu'il parle après, il voit la bibliothèque, the library, Fred, very little library. He sees Goethe, and he sees who else? Kaiserling. And they both, they leave Okru, and they leave from Goethe to Fred Avenue. Okay, you see two dancoons, my monsieur. Um, uh, comes up, who's that calcum? Who leaves a lay four leave, nice one. Who's that cultive? Come on, ask a book who they come in, come at and cream. Very young. And finalement, the monsieur, you'll entend que je tape à la machine. Uh, et Fred dit, excusez-moi, je vais vous présenter mon ami Henri Miller. Alors, Henri Miller, je ne veux rien dire, mais <laughs> j'avais une figure assez uh, impressionnante, n'est-ce pas, un peu vieux et uh, sérieux. <laughs> et il dit, qu'est-ce qu'il écrit, le monsieur Et Fred dit, la, la philosophie, n'est-ce pas, la métaphysique, et, uh, oui, comme un gourou. Ah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 Et comme ça, 
Fred, it's a, um, how do you say, exonere, you know? Exonere. Exonere. Uh, if they may, attention, ne repetez pas, n'est-ce Si ma fille viendra encore une fois à la prison, n'est-ce pas? It was wonderful. Ah, oui. Avenue Anatole France, Clichy. Dear Emil, it doesn't go so easily, the watercolor business. This one is a sample of what I can turn out, a sample of my inability to make headway. I just must get some first-hand knowledge, a little idea of the craft, something beside inspiration and enthusiasm. I'm disgusted for the moment. Night before, in despair, couldn't write. Doubts, failure, old age. Morning comes, the bowels move, the earth groans. I don't think about any single thing, but about all things at once. I want to show the world that not all the great surrealists are dead. I want a classic purity, where dung is dung and angels are angels. The Bible a la King James, for example. The glorious, death-dealing Bible that was created when the English language was in flower, when a vocabulary of 20,000 words sufficed to build a monument for all time. Well, here I am. I can write, and I will write, and nobody will deny me. I will write what no man dares to say, and they can take it or leave it, but I think they will take it. But at any rate, I found my voice there in Paris, and I wrote that book which... Uh I guess started all the trouble and the success at the same time. And that was the Tropic of Cancer. It is now the fall of my second year in Paris. I was sent here for a reason I have not yet been able to fathom. I have no money, no resources, no hopes. I am the happiest man alive. A year ago, six months ago, I thought that I was an artist. I no longer think about it. I am. In the last few years, one sees quite a few either writings about you or quotations from you about dreams and the dream life. <laughs> and I feel that they haven't really understood what you mean about this. I don't think you want people to be living in a dream state while uh, conscious, uh, do you, and walking around, or no. they should be, in, no. But you mean that the dream has its uses, its, uh, its effectiveness uh, yes. in life afterwards. Yes, or, no, I meant something else. I meant that we could arrive at a state where what we dream at night would be like the blueprint for what we wish to fulfill or yes. to reach and yes. if we understand the dream then we know what the secret self yes. is and then yes. this secret self we can we can uh, fulfill i think one thing that they overlook very much in your writing especially the diary writing is that who can be more explicit and realistic than you at the same time isn't that right <laughs> yes. you have that mixture of the two things you're able to take this uh, dream thing and the fantasy and then um, uh, expose it through the characters and the events that appear in the diary. Um, the diary should never give the impression, I imagine, that this is something concocted in an opium state, you know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> I huh? And some do look at it that way. They're always asking. Did these things really happen? Did she do these things? Do you see what I mean? Isn't that so? I know. <laughs> mm. Is it any wonder that there are so many poet painters in France? Wherever the eye falls, there is color. Irregularity. Whimsy. Individuality together with all the evidences of age and use, the patina of life lived. Even in the simple matter of dress, there is a marked lack of uniformity. As for the shops, they are infinite in variety. 
as variegated as the proprietors themselves. As for the street itself, there one may still see the old and the bent, the crippled, the half-witted, the mutile de la guerre, the genuinely demented, the beggars and tramps, the drunkard, pitched against a plenum of colorful, dilapidated walls, windows of every size and description, shaded alley, cathedrals. Notre Dame rises tomb-like out of the waters. Hideous and charming monuments, strident posters and billboards, chimney pots and black roofs, or pale rose and sienna roofs, vegetables piled sky high and arranged like gems, mangy cats, sad looking curs, everything imaginable and often unimaginable, all bizarre and nostalgic, thoroughly offbeat. A melange or a stew that never fails to whet the appetite of a poet or a painter. After Clichy, I moved into the Villa Sora, where I had a studio and some real comforts. The street itself was famous for harboring many well-known painters, sculptors, musicians. Here, I finished the third or fourth revision of Tropic of Cancer, wrote Tropic of Capricorn, Max and the White Phagocytes, Ale Retour, New York, finished Black Spring, and began the Hamlet letters with Michael Frankel. The street itself was an interesting street. When you think of the names of the people who once they lived there, there hmm? beginning uh, with the corner house, the best uh, one, where Dali had his studio. Yeah, the, there was Gromer, there was Lursa. Mm -hmm. in, in my house, oh. after Frankel moved out a long time later, uh, Soutine took the place. I could always see you as the very young man who knocked at my door at the Villa Sera. You came in, you peeked in, you put your head in the door, the crack, I can see you, you know, I grabbed you and hugged you, and you've always remained to me like that. As you get to be 70 years old and I'm 95 or 100, I'll still think of you as well. I was particularly struck by his greeting because after hugging me, he said, let me take a look at you. And then he pulls up my trouser leg and says, Christ, you're built like a tree. <laughs> <laughs> That's the original way of being greeted by the chef. But also, I remember that first impression was he was like a, a boxer. He was a, he wasn't exactly a phantom. He was heavier than that, yet he was light. Uh, but he had that uh, light-footed quality, agility and everything, and uh, pug a little bit of pugnacity in his, which he still has in the chin. Did you have to deal with publishers, sir? <laughs> yeah, it was wonderful. He always struck me as a boxer. I do not find it so strange that America placed a urinal in the center of the Paris exhibit at Chicago. I think it belongs there, and I think it a tribute which the French should appreciate. How is a Frenchman to know that what impresses the American in looking at a Pissotier or a Vaspesian or whatever you call it, is the fact that he is in the midst of a people who admit to the necessity of peeing now and then, and who know also that to piss, one has to use a pisser. I am a man who pisses largely and frequently, which they say is a sign of great mental activity. One likes to piss in sunlight among human beings who watch and smile down at you standing behind a tin strip and looking out on the throng with that contented, easy, vacant smile, that long, reminiscent, pleasurable look is a good thing. How many times have I stood thus in this smiling, gracious world, the sun splashing over me and the birds twittering crazily, and found a woman looking down at me from an open window, 
Standing thus with heart and fly and bladder open, I seem to recall every urinal I ever stepped into. To relieve a full bladder is one of the great human joys. I suppose it was no accident that being enamored of the work of Paul Clay, I finally became bosom friends with the painter who could rightfully be called his twin soul. I mean Hans Reichel, whom I got to know soon after my arrival in Paris. If I were limited to knowing only one artist in a lifetime, one who had enabled me to discover the purpose and the meaning of art, I would probably say, give me Hans Reichel. Reichel was of the damned, a true poet modine. Wedded to his art, he lived it day by day, lived for nothing else. It was his misfortune to paint in a manner which reminded one of Paul Clay. How can I help it, he once said to me, if we see the world through the same eyes. Now, isn't it like entering a, a little chapel here, isn't it? Yeah. Huh? Something holy about it, isn't there? Reichel's world was a limited one. It comprised a few, very few, devoted friends. In truth, he hardly ever left the precincts of the 14th arrondissement where he lived. For him, it was sufficient to take a stroll through the Parc Montserrat or the Luxembourg Gardens. He had friends there whom he visited regularly. The birds, the plants, the fishes, the squirrels. He talked to them and they answered him. A small world perhaps, but a full and rewarding one. Do you think that an author, he has uh, definite ideas and plans? Well, you do in a slight way, but you write in order to find out what you're writing about, who you are and why and what for. Do you understand? It's a dis voyage of discovery. If you begin with all your charts and plans and compasses and everything, it's a dead thing. You get where you want to go, but the object of writing is to not know where you're going. My hatred and rebellion against the society we live in, especially our American society, made me choose foul language not to shock them so much because I am disturbed and angry and so on. So all I can say is that shit, fuck, piss, and all that, you know what I mean? Get it out, spill it on them, uh, you know? That's what I said, a Russian shirt. Do you know, one of the first things I remember about you is yeah. once I'm standing on the Boulevard Aspai trying to read French, and uh, there was vécu, V-E-C-U, and I asked him, what does that mean? And when I learned, you know, that it's the past participle of to live. It's <laughs> so simple, you know. I only knew beaver. <laughs> Tell me about your life. Oh, you know are. what I was uh, doing all my you do life. The same. I paint pictures, that's all. Yeah, I paint yeah. pictures. And religiously, every day. I try to continue tradition. Yeah. Just, and I'm not bothering about doing anything new at all. Yeah, yeah. And maybe, and maybe I'm doing a bit of contribution of my own, all the same. You know, the one painter I love very much after all the years is, I look at his work with, is Bonnard. Bonnard is who tremendous. Who lived that beautiful, <laughs> quiet life and did. Bonnard is tremendous. Yeah. And 46, first Salon d'Auton after the war, and Sartre, and Giacometti, and everybody starts. Oh, oh, how wonderful. They discovered Bonnard. Yeah. Everybody yeah. was discovering Bonnard. Who had already been painting a long of time. Course, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Whoever loved Bonnard knew about Bonnard long before. Bonnard is completeness, full, an open vision of, on the world, you see, on, on reality, and it's, it all goes through his eyes, through his vision, and it's pure and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. By the way, why don't you uh, pull out something of yours that you like? Yeah. Uh, something you like, huh? 
All oh. this is in the making. I'm doing a lot of things on paper. Uh, on paper now? With the uh, oil, you mean? Oh, yes. I sell a picture unfinished, always. Really? My I'm... clients buy from me unfinished jobs. They pay me, then I finish the picture for you. Is that right? Not before. <laughs> Yeah. There, you see, I'm working for you. You know why I mentioned singing? Because now your work reminds me so much of his writing, you know that? It's like you're inexhaustible in this uh, theme, huh? Uh, the human being, the human being we yeah, want. Yeah. Nothing else, the human being. Life, uh, a cow, an animal, a horse, anything. Uh, Ask me what I have in my head, I have nothing. Yeah, yeah. All my brain goes into my finger. Yeah. Uh, the brain is in the fingers, and I have a hell of a time to give a title to a picture. Yes. So yes. I'm just the same as an abstractionist. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that I'm fearfully faithful to life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It was a tremendous pleasure to get out into the provinces. Every province in France is extremely interesting, colorful, a uh, nation unto itself. Mountaineers, land people, it's wine country which makes for some sort of happiness. And it's an authentic sort of country. All agricultural countries where the people live close to and on the land have a kind of bone structure. It was there that I found people who were lazy, and who knew how to talk and how to live, how to do nothing. And it was a great relief after the northern spirit of uh, France. It's architecturally very beautiful. Uh, it's French, which means that the eating is quite better than anywhere else in the world. There's contentment of the belly. I much prefer to live down there than to live in Paris or any other city of France. But there's a metaphysical uneasiness which is creative. Uh, now, I've got something uh, rather urgent I wanted to ask right, you. Good. I, couldn't, I couldn't sleep last night. Yeah. And I took that book about suicide up to bed, and mm. I remembered all our conversations about Nijinsky's madness and so on and so forth. And I wondered, is suicide uh, or the desire for a young man's feeling or an elderly man? Does one feel more and more suicidal or less and less as one goes on? I was more at 20 and less now at 50. That's right. How did it work with That's you? The same, same with me, yeah. yeah. Except I could say that now and then there are little interludes. Uh, it uh, so mm -hmm. uh, and it's terrible when it occurs later in life, um, the desire to commit suicide. But it doesn't last as long. Oh. You see, when, when you're younger, you could have this feeling it could go on for weeks at a time, months, do you know what I mean? You're desperate and whatnot. Everything is black. Uh, later in life, it comes quick, sudden, like that, for no reason, it seems to me. But it also passes more quickly. Oh, that's my feeling, but no, uh, each one Did you ever destiny. choose a method? Yes, I had several methods, you know. Huh? Yeah, drowning was one. Oh. I Yes, I tried that once. At the you beach. tried it? Yeah, I, and I tried uh, taking the pill. You know, I, I had a friend, a doctor, who gave me the pill to commit suicide. And to make sure that it would work, I opened the windows wide. It was winter. The snow came in. I lay naked on the bed. He must have given me a sleeping pill. I thought he really gave me something to kill me. I took it. I went to sleep immediately. I woke up. The snow was on me, and I didn't even have a cough. <laughs> yeah. One of the few places in France where real bullfights are still held. In the arena at Nîmes, a Roman amphitheater where the Christians of old were crucified and fed to the lions. Imagine dying in this glorious arena at four in the afternoon in the presence of a hundred thousand crazy Roman sadistic monsters. When you were driving, did you occasionally select a tree? No, that I would never want well, to Well, I, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they said all these plane trees which you love in Provence so much. Oh, I have such trouble, because sometimes when I'm a little drunk and I'm driving, 
I mentally select one with my eye and it's so terribly easy, then I have to slow down. Mm. I never had that for you. Yeah. I've never wanted to do that. I don't I want any agony, any uh, maimed limbs and oh. whatnot. Sure. No. no. Uh, the pill seems wonderful, or any, any method that's uh, easy and gentle and so on. Huh? I never believed people who said that uh, the, the obsession of death, you remember, that Frankel had and Longfellow, yes. and that you yes. shared that, and I said, no, I didn't think yeah. so, ever. Um, you played with yeah. them and their own terminology, if you want, but you never yeah. were very concerned about that. Yes. Well, I tell you, about I About destruction, think, the destruction uh, yeah. of the world. But, but well, what they were talking about, really, Anais, was death and life, which so many people can... Ah, yes. Death and life, yes. don't you know, yes. I think. But you didn't know uh, anything about that. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, I become more aware of it all the time, though. That there are people who are dead in well, life. Oh, yes, yes, right. And that's the only death. That's the real death. Mm. Not this death when you depart the body, but being dead while you're alive. That's, that's real death, mm. I think. I'll tell you one thing. You yes. got into this very, I yes, think, very through deeply. psychoanalysis. Yes. And from your talk, Eduardo, everybody's talk about analysis and yes, dreams. dreams and I began to dream heavily, yes. violently. And that every was those night. fifty pages, was And it? then then I learned how to mm -hmm. wake up without losing the dream. This mm -hmm. is an art and a discipline and I discovered that. I I've lost it again, yeah. but I can do it if I want. You learn how to wake up. Yeah. You don't wake up you don't open your eyes wide right away. And you know you've been dreaming when you wake up. And you close your eyes slowly again, and you hold on to that last thread and go back like into the labyrinth, trace it back, do you see? Back to dream. And when yeah. you got it all together, I'd get up out of bed in my pajamas and go right to the typewriter and record it. Mm -hmm. And not only record that dream, mm -hmm. but all the associations that came yeah. up with it. Do you remember, too, that Rump used to say, uh, uh, after a while, analysis will, uh, will be like vaccinated against it. When so many people have had analysis, there won't yeah. be any demand be any for, for it anymore, right? <laughs> yeah. And my, our friend, you remember David Edgar, always said that the neurotic of today is the man of the future, at least he's the germ of that man of the future. This neurosis, is a healthy thing. <laughs> I don't know, that's paradoxical too. Like a bridge constantly uh, to life. Right. And that the neurotic was like the romantic in the, in yeah. the old days. He has a vision. Yes. He's only unhappy because he can't fulfill this vision. Uh, and, and, you know, and he gets uh, self-destructive. He destroys himself if he can't have well. what he wants. Yes, so in the or, same or, as the romantic. Or it? don't you think too, though, the romantic that used to the most him. important thing about it is that is that he cannot adapt to this world, and he should not adapt to it, since it's a bad world. Mm -hmm. The world. Uh, there are two ways of looking at that. Either you destroy this world, lock, stock, and barrel, or you adjust to it in a way that you are detached from it. Mm -hmm. Someone wrote me a very amusing letter from Australia and said that you had uh, rearranged his molecules. Mm -hmm. you, had, you, had, you had changed the direction uh, of the molecules, uh, which I thought was a yeah, wonderful know, expression. No, that's why. That's being effective. You see, that is a change. I know. And that's what fascinates me about analysis, which I didn't find so much in the Oriental religions. They have in their legends stories of, of the, the seven planet. rounds that you make on Earth you know, or any planet, and then the dead wood, uh, Ibsen had a phrase, or I forget it now, like it's like the dead wood remains and rots on this planet, and those who are alive, what is that thing from the Bible, uh, alive and, uh, the quick and the dead, the quick are transported by, um, what, uh, uh, you yeah. know, spaceships to another planet. In other words, it's a matter of vision. It's a matter of uh, awareness, opening your eyes, uh, seeing the world differently. After all, the only difference in lives is 
is your point of view, how you look at the world. The world does not change. You change. And how do you change? By your different attitude. Whether you see it from down here, like the frog, as Spengler said, or up above, like the eagle, or still higher, like the gods. Do you know what I mean? Yes. That's the only difference there is, you, to me. Because yeah. otherwise, everything is the same. Yeah. No matter what you touch and you wish to know about, you end up in a sea of mystery.
to myself today, September the 17th, after a bloody, hectic uh, three weeks, huh? Such as I don't think I've been through in ages. If we get through this bloody business, we can thank all the gods there are, plus the Supreme Being, and Mahakali, Mother of All. What are we here for if not to enjoy life eternal, solve what problems we can, give light, peace, and joy to our fellow man, and leave this dear, fucked-up planet a little healthier than when we were born. Who knows what other planets we will be visiting and what new wonders will there unfold. We certainly live more than once. Do we ever die? That is the question. In any case, thank God we are alive and of the stars unto all eternity. I want to say amen. Mm -hmm.